Hello, I'm Stephen Sword, lead printer in the Massey College Bibliography Room. Welcome to my home print shop, the Stephen Soar Press. In this brief video, I'd like to talk to you about book typography, specifically book typography during the hand press period, from the original development of letterpress printing in the 1450s through the early decades of the 19th century. As you know, the design and arrangement of printed books grew directly out of the traditions developed by manuscript book production that preceded it. But the methodologies of the two were very different, influenced by the tools used for each. Let's explore those methods. In the manuscript tradition, the scribe began by ruling lines on the two-page spread of the parchment sheet, lines to show the margin of the text area, and lines to guide the writing of the text. With these guidelines in place, the scribe relied on skills with the pen to create an even and readable text, making use of a variety of devices and techniques to make each line fit neatly within the margins. For the printer, the composing stick used in the setting of type and the building block nature of the type itself produced a similar structure and uniformity of lines. But a certain degree of planning was needed before the setting could begin. The planning, together with the implementation by the compositor, are the activities that constitute what we call typography. We're going to take a look at three steps in this process. These are A, the book format and paper size, B, laying out the two-page spread, and C, realizing the plan in type. A, the format in paper sizes. It may seem mildly paradoxical, but typography starts not with type, but with paper. No decisions can be made concerning type until important decisions are made about the format of the book and the paper to be used. Book formats are undoubtedly familiar to you by now, from the large folios to smaller octavos and duodecimos. Each format has implications for the typography of the book, relying at the same time on the content of the book and on the intended audience. But the formats themselves depend on the sizes of paper to be used. Paper sizes during the hand press period were limited. Gaskell, in his new introduction to bibliography, lists four common sizes, and each papermaker would have produced sheets comparable to these four with minor variations. Printers had their presses made to correspond to sizes of paper they intended to use, and almost always printed full sheets. The three sheets shown here correspond to three of the four sizes listed by Gaskell, but unlike the sheets printers would have used, these have cut edges, not the deckle edges of mold-made paper. As important as page size are the proportions of the page. Book typography has an aesthetic element, and the shape of the page plays a large role in our experience of a book. The producers of manuscripts had identified page proportions that they felt were ideal, and printers did not hesitate to follow that example. Page proportions generally follow two patterns. If Gaskell's list is indicative, the more common of these were sheets with proportions of roughly 1 to 1.4, known as root 2 rectangles. Without going into the mathematics of it, root 2 rectangles have one very distinctive feature, a convenient one for the printer. Each time the sheet is folded, full sheet to folio, folio to quarto, etc., the new page retains the root 2 proportions. This differs significantly from the other common sheet proportions, sheets that have proportions of either 2 to 3 or 3 to 4. Why do I mention two different ratios? Because each is the inverse of the other, which is to say that if I take a sheet with proportions of 2 to 3, when folded once, the pages of the folio will have sides in the ratio of 3 to 4, a much squarer shape, and vice versa. So this sheet, when folded a second time, for a quarto, will revert to the 2 to 3 proportions.
This alternating pattern between narrow and wide has significant implications for the typography of the book. Here are some samples of each showing the patterns of proportion after folding. It may interest you to know that many North American paper and book sizes have proportions closer to 2 to 3 or 3 to 4, such as 12 inches by 18 inches and 17 inches by 22 inches. My copy of Gaskell's book is 6 inches by 9 inches, a ratio of exactly 2 to 3. But the European metric A sizes are all based on the root 2 proportions. B. Laying out the two-page spread. Once the paper size and book format have been decided upon, the next stage of the typographic planning concern the size, shape, and position that the text block will occupy on the page. The area is delineated by the lines drawn by the scribe to guide the hand. These decisions are, like those earlier, rooted in tradition. But there are various approaches, and as printing evolved, printers developed approaches to this part of book design that diverged from the manuscript tradition. But no less than the scribal predecessor, the printer must visualize the page as a whole and determine how to place the text upon it. The page size and proportions will play a large role in this visualization. Here, a large folio page with the squarish proportions approximating the folded 2 to 3 ratio may call for the use of columns, which will, in turn, guide the choice of type size. While here, a quarto with a narrower shaped page may be better suited to a single block of text. The most common proportions for the text block are those of the page itself. A text block with the same proportions fits naturally on the page. The actual size of the text block depends on many factors, not least of which is economy. The more text on a page, the less paper will be required for the book, and the cheaper the book can be. So the printer must consider who the likely buyers are. But it is not only the size of the text block that matters for the reader. It is also the position of the block on the page. From the printer's perspective, the easiest positioning is centered in the page, and many 19th century manuals instruct this type of positioning. However, the manuscript scribes had recognized that when the two facing pages are considered as a unit, it is preferable to bring the two text blocks towards each other near the center margin and to place them above center on the page. This is not only more attractive to the eye, but also creates larger margins for holding the book and even making annotations. This part of the design will not be realized until the imposition stage when the page blocks are positioned in the chase before the printing form goes to press. With the size and position of the text block decided upon, there may be a host of other typographical decisions. Many of these will be more stylistic than functional, but they include such considerations as, one, will there be running heads, pagination, catchwords, chapter heads? Two, are side or footnotes part of the book? Three, are there to be illustrations with or within the text? Four, will initial letters be used? And five, is a page border part of the design? Most of these items fall outside the text block itself, but need to be taken into consideration in the overall layout of the page. C, realizing the plan in type or implementation. The size of the text block determines the length of the lines that the composing stick will be set at. The size of the type to be used will, in turn, determine the number of lines per page. In the Massey College bib room, we have perhaps as many as two dozen distinct Roman text typefaces, some in only one size, some in several, some with accompanying italics or bold versions. This wealth of choice is not representative of historic printing experience. During the first hundred years or so of printing, a print shop would be fortunate to have three or four sizes of Roman type, if they're printing in Latin or scholarly texts of any kind, and three or four of a Gothic round hand, a lettering form common for the printing of works in the vernacular. In time, 
The Gothic round hand gave way to Roman for most works, except in Germany, where the fracteur types developed out of the earlier Gothics and became the type of choice for works in German. Aldus, printing in Venice, introduced italics as a text face circa 1500, and italics gradually gained favor for select purposes, especially as a contrasting face to be used with Roman. In any case, the range of type in any shop was very small. Printers designed all their jobs with this limited selection in mind. Though a printer might print in a variety of formats, the types used would be remarkably consistent. Interestingly, the names given to type sizes frequently bore some connection to their most common use, names such as brevier, long primer, and canon. In addition to the gradual demise of a separate type for vernacular works, there was another significant change in type over the first decades of printing. As we have remarked, the model provided by manuscripts was scrupulously followed in the early days of printing. To achieve the effect of manuscript with type, printers felt obliged to mimic the tricks used by scribes by casting multiple versions of many letter forms, and also to create a host of ligatures, linked letters, and special symbols to represent common scribal short forms. These extra characters in the type case helped compositors with the difficult task of justifying their lines, but it was also a cumbersome arrangement, costly and time-consuming in the production of type. As a result, over time, fonts of type were simplified, and the many variant characters, plenitude of ligatures, and special short forms were reduced to the bare minimum found in fonts today. Of the scribal short forms, only the ampersand remains. The challenge of justifying lines of type didn't go away, though. Compositors need to be adept at anticipating what can be fitted into a line, adjusting the spacing between words and making suitable word breaks. Like those of scribes, many of the early printing word breaks would not meet modern standards. In time, the better printing houses established house rules to guide the compositors in their decisions and assure consistent practices. Here, a line of type is reaching completion and I will need to adjust the spacing to make the type fit snugly in the composing stick. In the line before, the last word has been broken to make the line work. My success in this task will affect the handling further along in the printing process. Justifying lines of prose poses the most obvious and frequent challenge to the compositor but there are numerous others. In many ways, the printing of poetry and verse drama may be the most straightforward for composition because line justification is not required. But verse drama poses its own challenges with the need to include character names and stage directions, which may need to be in contrasting type. Even more challenging can be the setting of scientific and mathematical texts that may include equations, special symbols, and tables of data, as well as complex and accurate diagrams. Compositors were also often tasked with correcting spelling, grammar, and punctuation in the text on the fly. Another set of tasks that called for house rules to assure consistency. Remarks on printers' systems of measurement. We have access to a variety of measurement systems, metric, millimeters and centimeters, imperial, inches and feet, and typographic measures, points and picas. But the printers of the hand press period did not work with these. They used the techniques used in all the trades, using compass and rule geometry and measurements that were based on proportion, not on ruler measures. How did they do it? While most printers probably never drafted their page layouts on paper, if they had desired absolute accuracy, they could have done so using the same techniques used by scribes, using straight lines to divide the page into desired proportions, determining both the size and position of the text blocks geometrically. Line lengths relied on a different type of proportion. It would be expressed as a number of M's of the type being used. That number of pieces of type from the font, turned 90 degrees from the usual setting position, would be placed in the composing stick, and the knee of the stick would be snugged up to the type to establish the line length. 
In this example, I am setting 16 M's of double pica type. This is called making measure. The vertical length of the text block would be established as a certain number of lines of type. My 16 M line might work well with a depth of 24 lines, depending on the shape and size of the page. Then, in case different sizes of type are being used in the text, a simple page gauge might be cut from cardstock for the compositor to use to test against completed pages. Finally, when the pages are imposed and ready to be locked up in the chase, the space between them is established by the simple expedient of using a folded sheet of the paper to be printed on. By using it to measure from page edge to page edge, it is possible to determine the separation between the pages. This process is called making margin. Book typography began as an effort to replicate the appearance of the manuscripts it was reproducing. In time, typography established its own patterns, which, while maintaining many of the traditional characteristics of the manuscript book, better reflected the strengths and limitations of letterpress technology. In this video, I have tried to show that typography follows a natural sequence of design decisions, each in some way dependent on the previous ones. In the 20th century, typography became the domain of specialist designers, but had long been the domain of the printer himself, who carried the arrangement of the page and the type from the conceptual stages right through the implementation in type. Their methods were simple ones, guided by the very nature of the materials they were using. Thank you for joining me on this brief exploration.